All right, church. So uh, there is <clears throat> kind of a great irony in the selected sermon series for the next few weeks. Uh, so in the EPC 101 class last Sunday, I made the comment that I was not going to preach through Jude because it had some wonky stuff in it that not everyone was going to agree on. But you guys know me by now. So we're embarking on a three-week study of Jude. And from the get-go, I want to say, lay out some honest realities about the book because there are some things we have to keep in mind. Jude is highly dependent on 2 Peter. Or 2 Peter is highly dependent on Jude. So that's going to affect how you approach the book, right? Uh, scholars are not sure. They're, they're, they're kind of split on which book is kind of the source material for the, next, the other book. All right, so either Jude used 2 Peter as a guide or 2 Peter used Jude as a guide. They share something like 80% of their content. So it's very interesting. So another thing, there are some very confusing lines in Jude that the original audience would have understood completely that we in the modern age just simply lack. So and that's a couple of reasons. It's either because, one, there's a historical reference there that we just don't have the source material for anymore, like they're, they're referencing a popular book or another letter of the apostles or something that we just don't have. Or there's this oral tradition somewhere that wasn't written down. And I can give an example of that second one that we have in recent culture because that concept can be, can be foreign to us. So Manny Ramirez was an incredibly talented baseball player, major league baseball player in the 2000s. He, he's Hall of Fame level talent, right? He's a special kind of guy. Um, however, Manny had these little quirks, right? He had these little quirks. He, he just would like would not hustle like at certain times. Like he would hit a ball on the ground and he just wouldn't run. Whether that be in the World Series, a, a, an elimination game, like he just had these moments in these crucial moments in the game where all of a sudden it just looked like he didn't care at all that he was out there on this baseball field. And so they coined a phase through those kinds of things and then some sayings he would have. They coined this phrase, that's just Manny being Manny, right? That's just Manny being Manny. And in the baseball world, you could say, that's just Manny being Manny, and everyone would know exactly what you're talking about. Like, that's a weird quirk. That's just who he is, right? That's Manny being Manny. But the problem is a thousand years from now, if someone's quoted, and like, and if someone found this sermon in some archive floating in space, they'd have no idea the context, except for me explaining it, what that's Manny being Manny means. Like, we could say it, and we know it, but they wouldn't know it. They wouldn't get it. So we can understand how there may be something in current culture that's oral, that the local culture would understand, but that the audience 2,000 years down the road wouldn't have any concept of what was happening there. So that being said, uh, here's what we mostly know about Jude. Jude was most likely written by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus. It was written sometime in the 60s AD, but scholars differ whether that's early 60s or late 60s, and that's because do you think it predates 2 Peter or do you think it postdates 2 Peter? So there's that. We know the occasion or kind of what prompted the letter. Jude is seeking to address this kind of ingress of false teaching into the church. Okay. So that's the reason he wrote it. And so now we kind of know the purpose. Jude is going to encourage a largely Jewish Christian audience to resist the contamination of the gospel and to adhere to sound doctrine, right? Resist the contamination of the gospel, adhere to sound doctrine. So that's our kind of contextual overview. Let's pray, ask the Lord for wisdom, and we'll begin studying our text. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your most holy word. May we come before it today with humble hearts, and willing minds to learn what you would have us know, to grow more like Christ and less like the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text this morning is going to come from Jude 1 through 4. And that's not chapters 1 through 4. Jude has 25 verses. So it's Jude verses 1 through 4. That's what we're working on this morning. And it's, if you remember your Bible, it's Jude Revelation. So if you get to Revelation and start backing up, you're going to bump into Jude, but it's going to be one page. All right, It's going to be a short, short little book for you with a lot of good packed theology. So Jude 1 through 4. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in the God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. 
for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Church, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of God stands forever. This is His Word. Thanks be to God. All right, so this morning we're really kind of just looking at the abstract uh, of the letter, or maybe like a better way to say that is the summary of the content and concern of the letter of Jude. But before we even reach the content and concern of the letter, we're given an incredibly like theologically rich introduction by Jude. And and church, this is uh, one of the reasons I love the New Testament. I love the New Testament because it's filled with theology, but it's filled with theology in such a way that you could easily just blow by it and not pick up what's happening in in these few verses, right? Um, So as such, we need to be a people who not only read the Bible textually and practically, but we also need to read the Bible theologically, right? We need to understand what theological arguments are being made in the text. So before we begin, I put in your bulletin, I didn't put in your bulletin, that's a lie. Deborah, for me, put in your bulletin um, this piece of paper. And and this is kind of an outline of Jude, kind of as we're going to kind of look at it. Um, and, and today we're just, you see, points one and two is all we're doing. We're not moving on to point three there. But just so you can kind of see what's happening in, um, in, the, uh, in the flow of the, the letter. And also be aware that Candace did not proofread that for me, so there may or may not be typos in that. I'm sorry if there are. All right, so we're going to focus on points one and two, the introduction and the purpose of writing. Let's begin with the introduction. Look again at Jude 1 through 2. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So we have our author, Jude, right? Brother of James. And if you remember James, he was the half-brother of Jesus. So Jude is family with Jesus. But before that, before Jude gives his familial relationship, right, who he's related to as his, his brother James, he provides his spiritual relationship. Did you notice that? He starts with his relationship to Christ. He says that Jude says he is a doulos, right? That's the word we have for servant. Doulos is the Greek word that we make servant or slave in this context. And and the more more accurate translation of this, um, we don't really have this concept today, but it's bond servant. It's bond servant or bond slave. That's what doulos really means. And it's worth stopping for a few minutes to dive into this. So uh, the first century concept of a bond servant is really not one we have today. Uh, it's not like servants or slaves that we have in our minds, especially not in the way that we understand them as our, with our, 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 the history of our country, United States. Like, it's not that same kind of thing. The phrase bondservant actually goes back to a ceremony described by Moses in the Old Testament. When a man went into debt, if he was unable to pay the debt back, he could choose to become the property of his creditor as a bondservant. But what makes the slavery or this servitude unique is, is how it's tied to the year of Jubilee found in Leviticus 25, 8 through 13. I'm going to read that for us real quick. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times 70 years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. And on the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your lands. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. When each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan, that fiftieth year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat of the produce of the field. In this year of jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. So every seventh year, debts were released, right? And that affected how much you would loan people, how far you were in that cycle, right? Um, But every 50th year, not only were all debts released, but on the Day of Atonement, very theological here, right? All the original land inheritance would go back to the people, and it would kind of reset Israel in its time of flourishing and inheritance as they first come into the land, right? So it's a big restoration. Ironically, um, there's not one instance in history of the year of Jubilee ever being obeyed. But there were some people, so you'd have these years of debt release, you'd have this year of jubilee, which we don't think ever actually was acknowledged. There was these people who remembered that as their own freemen, right, they, they ate poorly, 
Uh, they couldn't provide for themselves. They struggled to provide for their families. And they realized that under kind masters, they were well-housed, well-fed, and well-respected. And so most of these bond servants were not laborers in the field. Like they, they were what we would probably consider like managers, you know, supervisors. Um, they, they oversaw households. So think of like Joseph in Potiphar's house, right? Like high rank, a lot of authority, overseeing things for his master. And so what would often happen is that those men who knew the kindness and the love of a good master could enter into a covenant to remain as a bond servant and forfeit the debt restoration. Okay, they could just say, you know what, I'm having trouble doing this on my own. You are, for whatever, it could be a health thing, it could be a, a phys- physical, whatever it is, I'm going to come and be your bond servant, and I'm going to forfeit debt restoration, and he's going to take care of me, and I'm going to work for him. Right? He's a, he's a good master, a good, ser- a, good, a good person to serve. Such a person would be taken to the priest at the tabernacle. The priest would take an awl, which is like a hole punch, and he would punch a hole through the ear of the bond servant. And that symbol would forever identify that person as someone who chose to live under the benevolent kindness of a loving master. Okay, that's what the bond servant was. So when Jude says that he's a bond servant of Christ, when his primary identification, when he starts a letter, is a bond servant of Christ, this is what he's stating that the freedoms of this world, though they might come with material lands and wealth, are nothing compared to dwelling in the house of his master, Jesus. And he will proudly bear the mark of a bondservant, whatever that may be. That's what Jude is saying. And that one little say, a servant of Jesus Christ, that's what he's saying. So before Jude even reveals his connection to his brother, which is primarily just so people know which Jude is writing. Jude was a very common name back then. He wants to be crystal clear about his identity. What's Jude's identity? Bondservant of Christ. Bond servant of Christ. And so, church, the reality is if you claim to be a Christian, you are a bond servant of Christ. Your identity is forever bound to bear the mark of Christ. It's not with your country, it's not with your family, it's not with our sinful struggles. When you become a bond servant of Christ, all other ties, all other allegiances, they are severed, and you are His. And as the Bible tells us, you cannot serve what? Two masters. And Jude begins with this because it's critical to how the churches that he's writing, um, they need to have this firm understanding of who they are bound to. They need to know who they are bound to to understand what's moving, what's going to be happening going forward. All right, we squeezed every bit we can from those 10 words, right? So we know the bond servants, all right? Um, Let's look at the second half of our introduction. So Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, second half here to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So if you remember a few minutes ago, I said we need to read the Bible theologically as well as textually and practically. And in the first half of this verse alone, we've already seen how that, why that can matter, right? We now understand what a bondservant is, so the implications of that. But look at these three phrases we get here. We get first to those who are called, right? Then we get to the beloved in God the Father, And then we get those who are kept for Jesus Christ. So let's break those down. To those who have been called. So theologically, there are two types of callings in the Bible. There's a general call, and there's a particular call. The general call is kind of the indiscriminate preaching of the gospel. So what I'm doing here today is I'm proclaiming a general call of the gospel, right? It's broad. It's to everyone who can hear, to hear. It's a general call of the gospel. The particular call is also called the effectual call. And that's all of those people who hear the general call, right? That, that God, through the Spirit, enables them to receive the general call, right? A circumcised heart. They receive it by faith and they're reborn in newness of life. That's the effectual call, right? So the general call is just the proclaiming of the word. The particular call is when that calling is effectual in the heart of the hearer. You see that? Okay. Uh, so when Jude says... To those who've been called, who's he speaking to? Is that general call or is that particular call, right? Or the effectual call? And I'm going to argue that the following two phrases are going to tell us that he's speaking to those who are particularly or effectually called. In other words, he is, call, he is speaking to true Christians, to bond servants of Christ. That's the intended audience right here. Uh, but don't just take my word for it. Let's keep going. Beloved in the Father. Next phrase. The Greek here, 
is better translated as who are loved by God the Father, right? Who are loved by God the Father. So um, the question becomes, are those who have rejected God's general call, right, who are not, don't have an effectual call, can we say that they are loved by God the Father? And as harsh as it may sound, the answer is no. Right? Because, because the, when the Bible speaks of the Father's love, it's speaking of this unique agape love, which is this unconditional type of love for his chosen people. It's, it's covenantal love. It's, it's kind of love you have for a son. It's adoptive love. And, of course, we can say generally, yeah, God loves his creation. Right? Like, he loves all people. He loves the plants. He loves the animals. He has love for all things. But there is a unique kind of love for his people. Right? In the same way you have a unique kind of love for your sons and your daughters, there's a unique kind of love he has for his people. And so God is speaking, or Jude is speaking of those who God loves in agape love, the unconditional love of the Father. So, so far, this bond servant of Christ is writing to those who are effectually called, right? So they are truly saved and thus are unconditionally loved by the Father, right? So you get that, that agape love by the Father. And now, thirdly, he's writing to those who are kept for Jesus Christ. And once again, the Greek's a little tricky here, but it makes more sense as this. Who are kept by Jesus Christ. That word can be by or for, by or for. I'm going to show you why I think it's by. But those kept by Jesus. Jesus Christ. This echoes the word of John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Right? So it's not kept for Christ. Christ is the one who does the keeping. Right? Christ does the keeping. That's what John 10 tells us. He is a shepherd. He does the keeping. So kept by Christ. So here's what we have. I was going to put this all together. I'll throw it back up there for you, that verse. What we have is those who are called, which is the work of the Spirit, changing the heart, right? Those who are beloved by the Father, work of the Father, adopting, calling us sons. And those who are kept by Christ, the work of Christ. This is fascinating. So we, we are simply, in these three phrases, we are getting the theological and Trinitarian Tenets, doctrine of election, those who are called, adoption, sons of God, and the perseverance of the saints, those that are kept by Christ. Let's put it all together. All right, ready? So, from James, a bondservant of Christ, and we know what that means, to those who are chosen, adopted, and we might say safeguarded by Christ. Chosen, adopted, safeguarded, or sustained by Christ. Church, that's a beautiful way to describe the church. Right? Like, we don't typically describe the church like that. That's a great way to describe the Christian life. And you couldn't hope for a better description to find in Scripture. Right? That's good. So we have the work of the persons of the Trinity. We have the major theological categories of bond servants. We have the chosen, the adopted, the safeguarded. This is how Jude sees the church. This is how he looks at the church. And, and the question moving forward, a couple questions is first is, is that how you see the church? Do you see the church as a group of bond servants who are called, who are adopted and sustained by Christ? Do you see the people in this room as fellow bond servants, chosen, adopted, and safeguarded by Christ? Do you see other faithful churches in our community as Bond servants who are chosen, adopted, and saved by Christ, or are they competition? You see, if you don't see the churches like this, if you don't see the body of Christ like this, then you have to start asking why. You have to start asking why you don't understand what it means to be a bond servant to a one master, why you don't understand how, what it means to be chosen, adopted as a son, and kept by Christ. And once you start asking those questions, you need to start asking the Lord to, to work in your heart. Because these are fundamental gospel issues that the church should understand. You see, this is the problem with the epistles. They're so rich theologically, I can never get through them. It take me too long to get through them. But I promise verse 2, yeah, only verse 2 is much quicker. We're going to get through verse 2 much quicker. Look with me at Jude 2. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. 
So notice it doesn't say, now, go multiply mercy, peace, and love. Right? And it say, now, other places we're told to do those things. Acts of mercy, we're told to love. I mean, we're, that's, a, that's a given. But this is different. What Jude is doing is he's giving a blessing. He's giving a blessing. What he's saying is, may God multiply mercy, peace, and love among the fellowship. Like God's action of multiplying these things. In other words, the world might ask what benefit it is to claim Christ and to submit ourselves as his bondservants, right? Because that's, that's a kind of an odd thing culturally for us. What, what benefit, when you could have the inheritance, why submit as a bondservant to Christ? Because often the life of a bondservant can look dull. It can look overly self-denying. It can look like servitude or slavery in many cases because you're bound to the will of somebody else. But Jude tells us that the benefits of a bondservant of Christ are the very things this world desperately seeks, right? Mercy from tormented consciences, right? Peace in a world of turmoil and love unlike anything this world can offer. So and there's another, another wonderful irony there. What the world sees as missing out on something, we know to be ultimate freedom. Right? A bondservant of Christ is ultimate freedom because your dependence is upon your master. He takes care of you. Right? And as, maybe as Paul says it, he says it beautifully, he says, what the world sees as madness we understand to be truth. It doesn't make sense to a broken world. There's no better life. There's no better inheritance than that of a bondservant of Christ, called, adopted, safeguarded by Christ himself. And so in our introduction to this brief letter of Jude, we're absolutely slammed with content, like absolutely slammed with theological realities in which Jude gives us the state of those who are in Christ. They are bondservants, called, loved, and kept. And then the blessings for those that are in Christ, mercy, peace, and love multiply, not by something we achieve, but by the work of the Father amongst his children. As with these things in mind, that we read the rest of the letter. That's the context we're going to carry into the rest of the letter um, and and understand what Jude is telling the church. So with that, let's turn to what we're going to call Jude's urgency, found in verses 3 through 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain peoples have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people, who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So we can break the urgency into two sections. The the call to contend for the faith in verse 3, and then his warning of the the, the challenges that we are contending against in verse 4. Let's go back to... Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So Jude begins with this call to contend for the faith by calling first, first word in there, the Christian's what? Beloved. Right, so, so what Jude is doing is he's tying the specific church in with those that are beloved by the Father and kept by Christ. Right? He's letting them know you're part of this category. Don't forget that. Beloved, loved by the Father, kept by Christ. He's encouraging them and reminding them that, yes, even you, in the midst of this turmoil, are loved and kept by Christ. And church, sometimes we need this kind of encouragement, right? Like sometimes Christians can find themselves so steeped in sin that they, or they feel so alienated from Christ that they need a loving reminder that they're loved by the Father and kept by Christ. And we all need to be reminded that our obedience as bondservants of Christ, it's not done out of earning favor, but it's done out of a response to favor already given. That's the actions of people who are bondservants of Christ. It's a response to love and favor already given. I would bet that we struggle to be spiritual encouragers, like in general. Like we can struggle with that. And so one of the calls of this is that we do better. Like we strive to be a people who are spiritual encouragers to the other bond servants of Christ in our midst. After this encouragement, Jude continues, and he informs the audience that what he wishes he could have written was different than what he's about to write. 
right? He says, he says, I was eager to write you about the common salvation. However, I found it necessary to write about something else, right? So he wanted to write um, a, a letter that is celebrating the outworking of the gospel. However, some issues have come to his attention that need to be addressed, right? And so he finds it necessary instead to appeal to the churches, contend for the faith. The word translated as contend has the, the original meaning of exerting oneself without distraction to attain a goal. All right, so, so to, um, exert yourself without distraction to attain the goal, right? So contend for the faith. It means self-denial to overcome obstacles, to avoid perils, even accept martyrdom if necessary. In other words, it means that the highest concern of a bondservant of Christ is the purity of the gospel in the church. It's the highest concern, the purity of the gospel. And this contending should put the mind of the reader on red alert. Right? You see contend, that's an active, that's an aggressive word. We should be on red alert. There's something that requires our attention. This is kind of like a biblical check engine light. Right? It's a biblical check engine light for the local church. You can ignore it, but how long can you ignore it until some significant damage happens or you're left out in the cold? Church, there are a lot of broken down churches in this country because they refuse to heed biblical check engine lights. Refuse to heed them. They've allowed false teaching, belligerent pastors, manipulative theology, and deceptive practices to, to shoot off warning lights left and right. Warning lights are going everywhere, but they've never been corrected. And it's left the church in a state of disrepair. The church is shrinking today, not because the gospel isn't relevant, at least it's shrinking here, not because the gospel isn't relevant, but because the church didn't contend for the truth when it was time to contend. It ignored the check engine lights. And so the question is really simple. What are we contending for? The purity of the gospel. Not a bunch of little preferences, not a bunch of little nuances, the purity of the gospel. We must hold fast. We must fight for the truth of the gospel of Jesus because it is constantly under attack. And so this is the first concern in Jews' urgency. The church is failing to contend for the gospel of Jesus. Now let's look for the second reason for his urgency. It's, it's, it's the specific challenges facing the church which with, with which we must contend. Look with me at Jude 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So if verse 3 was kind of the call to arms, right? Contend, like, get ready. Then verse 4 is kind of the description of who we're fighting against. You're going to get the call to arms, and then verse 4 is going to tell you who the enemy is, all right? Um, so let's break that down. He gives us a bunch of qualifiers. There are people who've crept in unnoticed. So let's see. People who've crept in unnoticed, who were designated for condemnation, ungodly people, perverters of the grace of God with sensuality, and then by denying our Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So let's start working through some of those. People who've crept in unnoticed. In other words, these are people who look like us, who confess to believe what we believe, who didn't set off any alarm bells initially. They just seemed like everything was close enough. It seemed great. And church, it's, this is why it's so important. It's so critically important who you elect as elders because your elders are going to be the ones who are shepherding the flock and they're going to be the ones who are authorizing who's able to teach the body. Elections matter in the church and who you elect matters. It's critical that we pursue the purity of the gospel in all areas, kids' ministry and up. We don't sacrifice the kids' ministry because they're kids, right? Like all the way down, all the way up, we want the purity of the gospel of Jesus because the slide into false gospel is so easy. It's easy to slip into. Look, just turn on. It's, it's always amazing to me. If you turn on one of those prosperity preachers or one of the health and wealth guys or one of the healer guys, one of those people, and you see 45 to 75,000 people in this stadium, and you just think, how are people buying this nonsense? Right? And it's because they started the slow little slip long ago. And this is where they're ending up. Um, one person said really well, if you're, if you're flying, if I'm flying from Marshall to Dallas, and my trajectory is off by 1%, I'm going to land pretty close somewhere in Dallas, like I'll kind of, you know, close enough and correct it pretty easily. But if I'm flying from here to Seattle, 
and my trajectory is off by 1%, I'm going to be nowhere near Seattle by the time I fly the distance I should fly, right? And so what happens with the theological slopes is when you begin to slide off a little bit, if you don't do the correction, the correction things, if you don't, don't get back on track over a long period of time, one day you look up and you're just lost in the middle of nowhere. Church, this stuff happens all over the world. It happens in our pulpits. It happens in our shepherds. It happens in our music. We have Christian music that's catchy, that's emotionally stirring. Yet what do the words tell us about our God? These things creep in unnoticed. So we have the people who creep in unnoticed. Next he says, he defines the people as those who are long ago designated for condemnation. And they're an ungodly people. And so these ungodly people teaching a false gospel who slipped in unnoticed were long ago designated for condemnation. What does that mean? Well, scholars disagree on the reference. I told you there's some times in there that we're just, people just don't agree on things. They disagree on the reference. But if you remember that I said we have to read the Bible theologically as well as textually and practically, I think this is a good place for us to do this. If there are effectually called, loved, and kept bondservants of Christ, then that implies that there are those that are not effectually called, loved, and kept by Christ. Right? You can't have one without the other. I told the 101 class, if I gave uh, Gavin $100, by choosing to give Gavin $100, I chose not to give everyone else $100. See how that works? This is the reformed theological term that we say is predestination, right? And we, we see it all over, um, which simply states that God elects some to eternal life and condemns others to eternal damnation. And while this is not a sermon on predestination, uh, we, it's, it's here in our face, right? We, we've got to deal with it. It's here right before us. So, so here's what I believe Jude to be saying. From the beginning of time, the Lord knew that there would be those who would subvert and attempt to destroy those in Christ, right? And in the same way that the Old Testament Israelites had these false prophets in Israel, so the church has false teachers. They look like the real thing, they talk like the real thing, but they have these subtle things that are a danger and a threat to the purity of the gospel of Christ, right? The Old Testament prophets, we had this. We have it in the New Testament with, with teachers, right? Both are categorically ungodly, and they're both designated for condemnation. Think of the parable of the wheat and the tares. Does he, what does the owner of the field say? He sees the tares in there and he says, just let it all grow. I'll deal with the tares at harvest. Right? That's, that's what the Lord does. He says, yes, there's false teachers. I'll deal with them. But church, this should bring us confidence because none of this is a surprise to the Father. He's given us the tools to discern his most holy and wise word to repel and rebuff the ungodly teachers that do what? Look at the last part there. Pervert the grace of God with sensuality and by, by denying our only master, Jesus Christ. They pervert grace with sensuality. So usually the meaning of uh, sensuality means uh, living, um, like loose living marked with uh, sexual pleasure or sexual greed. And so these people are saying that instead of being more like Christ, it's permissible to indulge the flesh. So church, we see the argument in various um, non-biblical understandings of sexuality in our culture today, right? We see people say that marriage is not between one man and one woman. They say that sex outside of marriage is not a sin. They say sexual identity is who you are, not your bondservant nature to Christ. We have entire denominations that rally around this kind of sinful living. This is perverting the grace was sensuality. Next week, we'll see what Jude really thinks about this. But for now, what we need to hear is this. Be wary of anything that makes you look more like the world and less like Christ. Because that's going to be wrapped in all the beauty and all the appeal that a false gospel can possibly offer. And I believe Jude supports the conclusion with, with the second part of this description. He says, you know, those who are perverting grace with sensuality and then by denying our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Christians are, according to Jude? Bondservants, right? Bondservants of Christ. And that has implications for how we live. What does false teaching about the gospel effectively do? It denies Christ as our one and only Master and Lord. 
That's what it does. It removes him from being a master. People that we have claimed to be a bondservant of, it undercuts his lordship. In other words, a false gospel is a rejection of the status of a bondservant of Christ. And as such, church, it has no place in our lives. We should be wary of the check engine lights. We should be wary of false gospel. We should be wary of looking like the world. So church, the opening verses of Judah packed. Right? They're, they're absolutely slammed with theological and practical truths for the Christian. First, we see that we are bond servants of Christ. This is our identity. That's the mark that we bear. As such, we're chosen, adopted, we're safeguarded by the work of the three persons of the Trinity. The Spirit effectually calls us, the Father adopts us, and the Son keeps us. With this comes mercy, peace, and love from the Father among our fellow bondservants. And thus, we are to contend, contend against false teachers who bring false gospels. We're to pay attention to check engine lights that pop up from those who are claiming bondservant status, yet don't adhere to the gospel of Jesus, whether they be pastors, elders, teachers, or anybody else in the visible church. We're to avoid anything that makes us look more like the world and less like Christ. He is our one and only Master and Lord. Let's pray.